Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live at Ortho Virginia. I'm Dr. Matthew Walker, one of the shoulder and elbow surgeons at Ortho Virginia. Uh, I'll take a minute to introduce myself. I came from Richmond, grew up here, did my med school at UVA, my residency at uh, Shock Trauma in Baltimore, and a shoulder and elbow fellowship in Tampa, Florida with Mark Frankel, one of the leading shoulder surgeons on, on earth. Um, I've been practicing in Ortho Virginia for nine years. I did a year uh, in New York prior to that. Um, and we're going to talk about rotator cuff tears, which is something near and dear to my heart today. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Ortho Virginia, we have the largest multi-specialty orthopedic practice in Virginia. We've got offices in Richmond, where I practice, in Lynchburg, at Virginia Beach, and in Northern Virginia. Uh, any more information on Ortho Virginia, you can find that on our website at orthovirginia.com. So, I don't want to take up too much time with uh, telling you about Ortho Virginia and myself. Uh, we want to talk to you and uh, find out uh, about your questions regarding rotator cuff injuries and treatment. And I'll tell you a little bit about what I know about rotator cuffs and how we can help you uh, get through some shoulder pain that might be related to rotator cuff problems. So first thing I'll, I'll start talking to you about is what the heck is the rotator cuff? I get patients every day uh, who want to understand better what the rotator cuff is. So I made a poster for you guys. The rotator cuff is a group of four muscles and tendons that surround the shoulder. The rotator cuff has three important jobs. One is to elevate the arm. Two is to rotate the shoulder, which is where it gets its name from. And three is to keep the shoulder centered on the socket. It keeps the ball and socket stable. The four muscles in the rotator cuff are the supraspinatus, which is the top tendon, the infraspinatus, which is the top back tendon, the teres minor, which is the small tendon in the back of the shoulder, and the biggest one, which is the subscapularis in the front part of the shoulder. So these muscle and tendons make up the rotator cuff, help you move your shoulder. Rotator cuff problems come in all shapes and sizes. Most of these things can be divided into tendonitis, partial tears, or full tears. The rotator cuff is an important thing to talk about because most people are going to be affected by rotator cuff issues at some point in their life. Almost everybody's had shoulder pain. Most of the time that falls into a rotator cuff tendonitis category, but you can have partial tears and up to 60% of patients who are over 60 years old have full thickness rotator cuff tears. When I talk about rotator cuff tears, we can have partial thickness tears and full thickness tears. And the reason you can have both is because the rotator cuff is made up of multiple layers of tissue. Just like toilet paper is two plies, the rotator cuff has its own set layers of tissue. There are five layers of tissue in the rotator cuff. And as demonstrated in this photograph, you can have injuries or tears involving one or multiple layers. What we do to treat you depend on how extensive those tears are and how you respond uh, to certain therapies. Dr. Walker, we have a couple of people saying that they can't hear you, so do you mind speaking up a little louder? Yes, I'm sorry. No, 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 <laughs> perfect. Usually I'm very loud. Um, so the rotator cuff can be divided into five layers. You can have partial tears of some of those layers or full thickness tears of all five of those layers. And we treat you depending on how you respond to the initial therapy and how extensive the tearing is. Partial tears, as demonstrated in the subscapularis tendon on this photo, involve superficial fibers of the tendon or up to 80 or 90 percent of the tendon. Full thickness tears means all five layers of those tears of, of those tendons are completely torn and detached. Most partial thickness tears we treat with things like injections, physical therapy, uh, and things of that nature. Most full thickness tears require some kind of surgical intervention if they're giving you symptoms. Most tendonitis we treat with injections, physical therapy, and anti-inflammatories. So the vast majority of rotator cuff injuries that are not full tears can be treated with anti-inflammatories, cortisone shots, toradol shots, or physical therapy and anti-inflammatory pills. So that's good. Full thickness tears come in two categories, really. People that have symptoms and people that are asymptomatic. I said earlier that 60% of patients aged 60 and over have full thickness rotator cuff tears. That doesn't mean that everybody with a tear has symptoms related to the tear. So we tend to not repair asymptomatic rotator cuff tears. So if you have one that's found for some other reason, we don't necessarily repair that if you don't have any symptoms. But for symptomatic tears, tears that are giving you pain, tears that are giving you weakness, tears that are limiting your function, we recommend surgery for those tears. 
Now, let me tell you about shoulder pain. Rotator cuff pain tends to be in the side of the arm, in the anterior lateral aspect of the arm. People describe it as a dull, achy, gnawing type pain. It's often worse at nighttime when you lay down flat. It hurts with activities. You're weak when you do day-to-day -day things such as pouring a pot of coffee or a gallon of milk, reaching across your body to get the seatbelt in the car, getting to button your bra strap or tucking your shirts behind your back. All these things can be related to rotator cuff issues. Again, pain on the side of the arm. Rotator cuff pain doesn't typically go along the shoulder blade in the back. It doesn't typically go up into your neck. It doesn't cause numbness or tingles in the upper extremity. It certainly doesn't travel all the way down to your arm or your hand. If we find that those are some of your symptoms, we tend to look for other things that might be causing those problems. Um, when it comes to rotator cuff treatment, again, partial tears, tendonitis, treat with anti-inflammatories, maybe some injections, and physical therapy. Full thickness tears that are giving you symptoms require surgery. Most rotator cuff surgery these days are treated with an outpatient surgical procedure. Most of the time we're doing that arthroscopically, which means through the cameras, using small incisions. The problem with rotator cuff surgery is it's a long recovery. I always tell patients that I get the easy job and you get the hard job. And what I mean by that is surgery takes 45 minutes or so, you go home the same day, you have small incisions, three to five half inch incisions around the shoulder, but the recovery takes a long time. After we repair the tendon to the bone, it takes three months for that tendon to heal back down to the bone. So we have to protect you for that whole three month period of time. Now that doesn't mean that in three months you walk into the office and your shoulder feels great, the shoulder's weak, the shoulder's stiff, you've got to get the shoulder strength back. I always tell patients that recovery for rotator cuff surgery is really more like 10% per month recovery. It takes almost a year for the shoulder to get as good and strong as it's going to be before you're back to 100%. So it's a long recovery, something to think about with rotator cuffs. Any questions uh, from the audience? Yes, these things? that was all great information. So a couple questions coming mm -hmm. in. Uh, one we have, is there a difference, or sorry, what is the difference in rotator cuff tears and a frozen shoulder? Sure, that's a great question. So one of the, I think, most misdiagnosed things I see in my office is a frozen shoulder. A frozen shoulder is caused by thickening of the lining or the capsule of the shoulder. It's an inflammatory process. Inflammation causes a frozen shoulder. The inflammation that normally would go away in a couple weeks stays around and it causes the lining to thicken up and scar down. It's extremely painful. You lose motion both actively and passively, which means you can't raise your arm a certain amount and I can't raise your arm a certain amount either. It's stuck whether I raise the arm or you raise the arm. The rotator cuff is different from the lining in the shoulder. It's the muscles and the tendons that surround the shoulder. Sometimes the symptoms can overlap, but you typically don't get as stiff with rotator cuff injuries or tears as you do with a frozen shoulder. Wonderful. Dr. Zaslov repaired two tendons in my shoulder and then seven months later I fell and tore them. What can I do now or is it the same as before having to get them repaired? That depends a bit on how extensive the tears are. One of the reasons we tear rotator cuffs, probably the main reason, is that things wear out as we age. I hate to say it but it's true. I tell patients the rotator cuffs are kind of like your pair of socks. When you first get the socks they're thick and they're new and they feel great. And over time, you get some thinning of the heel or thinning of the big toe. The rotator cuff is like that. So once you get a tear, oftentimes it's a long-term wear and tear process. When you repair these things, you're oftentimes not repairing a perfect tendon back down to the bone. That's why you can get these recurrent tears. Whether you get it fixed again depends a lot on how well the tendon looks on the MRI, what type of tissue you have left, and, and whether or not that's a fixable tendon tear. Long-standing tears can cause the muscles of the rotator cuff to undergo fatty atrophy, which means the tendon has torn off the bone, the muscle has nothing to pull against, so over time the muscle wears out and turns into fat. Once the muscles undergo fatty changes, it's not typically a good idea to try repairing these things because they don't heal that well. So it depends on how your tendon looks. Okay, perfect. I've torn my rotator cuff and had the MRI to confirm it, but I've been putting off surgery because of COVID. 
Is waiting to get it fixed going to make it worse? I'm 73. That's a, that's a good question. The problem with rotator cuffs uh, is this. Once you tear, just like I, I mentioned, the tear can grow with time and the muscles can undergo fatty changes. So waiting for a period of time can make the tear worse, both from a size standpoint, meaning the tear can get bigger, and from a tissue quality standpoint, which means the tendon can get thinner and the muscles can undergo fatty changes. We usually advise fixing rotator cuffs as soon as possible. It's hard nowadays because of the pandemic. Most facilities that we operate on are undergoing pretty regimented protocols to screen patients, to screen guests. We're limiting people coming into the hospital and into the surgery centers, and we're doing our best we can uh, given the global pandemic. Perfect. Another question, I've had shoulder pain for 15 years. The MRI showed a complete tendon tear. However, I can still raise my arm and do plenty around the house. Is this unusual? I would, I would say this is actually the more common uh, presentation of rotator cuff injuries. It's usually something that's going on for a period of time. Usually people can still raise their arm. And the reason why is because rotator cuff has four muscle tendon units. Most tears are not huge tears involving all of those muscles and tendons. They tend to be tears that are one to three centimeters in diameter or width, and those are small to medium tears. Patients still have the ability to raise their arm uh, and they can still do day-to-day -day things, but they tend to have the pain from those things. So being able to use the arm and move it and raise it above your head does not necessarily mean that the rotator cuff is intact. You can have a small tear, but still have enough function of the remaining muscles to let you do some of those things. Perfect. Somebody just commented that they had rotator cuff surgery in 2013 and still have some shoulder pain in exactly the place you just pointed it out. It's not constant, but it comes in from after working out. What should you do? I always think start with the easy stuff. Get on some anti-inflammatories. Maybe you take those before the workouts. Ice the shoulder down afterwards. Don't forget to do the rehab exercise that you learn from the time when you had your recovery for the rotator cuff surgery because workouts with weights and swimming and other activities focus on some of the bigger muscles around the shoulder, but they don't often hit those small rotator cuff muscles. So doing the rubber band exercise that you learned during the recovery from, from the rotator cuff surgery should be a good thing to incorporate into your workouts. Start with that first, maybe you get an injection, maybe another MRI if it's not getting any better, but okay. start easy. Okay, which this leads into a couple questions have come in regarding exercise. Are there exercises that I should avoid and is lifting weights good or bad for my shoulders? That's a good question. I, I tell people I don't want you to restrict your activities just in case something might be bad for you. I don't think the human body is, is made to lift heavy weights, so if you're bench pressing 400 pounds, that might not be the best thing for your rotator cuffs, but I think moderate exercise with moderate weights, higher reps, I think are all good things for your body. And I think that the health benefits you get from working out and exercising outweigh the problems that might be caused by rotator cuffs. Day-to-day -day things that you can do to protect your rotator cuffs are keeping your elbows close to your side when you pick up heavy objects. So for example, if you're putting a heavy cooler on the back of the pickup truck, you don't want to keep your arms all the way out in front of you. Keep your elbows close to your side. When you're starting a lawnmower, pull in a way where your elbow stays close to your body and not pulling overhead. Those things will help minimize stress and strain on the rotator cuff. Okay, perfect. Hopefully I pronounced this correctly. Been diagnosed with complete tear of the supraspinatus. I do have pain in limited range of motion, but don't want surgery and I'm 60 years old. Can I live with this forever? You can. Uh, rotator cuff surgery is not life-saving surgery. So these are functional uh, improvement surgeries and pain relieving surgeries. What I, would, what I would tell you, what's the natural history of a rotator cuff tear? In general, if you tear a rotator cuff tendon, over time, the tendon tear will get larger and larger and larger. It might get to the point where you're not able to raise the arm. We call that a pseudo-paralytic arm. If you try to elevate the arm and it doesn't go anywhere, just the shoulder blade hikes up. You have a bigger problem at that point. You usually can't fix the rotator cuff tear, but there are other options to treat you in those cases. So if, if you want to avoid surgery, I think the key thing is to focus on the rotator cuff muscles that you have left, keep them stronger, but you have to know in the back of your mind that this could get worse and lead to a shoulder that has more dysfunction uh, and more pain and frankly less options for treatment if you go that route. Perfect. How long is the shoulder immobilized after surgery? 
Sure. I think some of this depends a little bit on the size of tear and uh, depends on surgeon preference. Uh, if you have a full thickness tear and you come to my office and we fix your rotator cuff, I'm going to keep you in the sling for six weeks. The first six weeks, you're not doing a whole heck of a lot. You're coming out to bend and extend your elbows. You're doing some small circles with the arm, but you're not doing much more than that. I don't even start you on physical therapy until the sling comes off. So six weeks for me, some people might keep you in for four weeks. Some people that have a massive rotator cuff tear might be in the sling for eight weeks, but I think six weeks is a good one to think about in your mind. Okay. Also with surgery, I've been told that you have to sleep in a recliner. Is that true or can I sleep in my bed? That's a great question. And I'll tell you, the, one of the biggest problems with shoulder pain and shoulder surgery is nighttime. Nighttime, everything seems to hurt worse in the shoulder. It seems that sleeping in a more upright position is more comfortable than laying flat. There's no real medical reason to sleep in the recliner, except that it might make you more comfortable. So you can sleep in the bed. I do tell patients that want to sleep in the bed to put pillows behind the back so they're upright uh, somewhat. Okay. I've had my right shoulder done four times and the left one done once. The right one still pops out of socket at times. Is there anything that can be done to help? There are potentially things that can be done to help a problem like that, but some of these things might not involve repairing the rotator cuff tendon anymore. I, I hate to say it, but after four rotator cuff repairs, you don't want to kick the, you don't want to do the same thing over and over again and, and expect for different results. Um, that's going to be depending on how your x-rays look, how the MRI looks, uh, but there are options for unstable shoulders that have pain and poor motion after multiple failed rotator cuff surgeries. Okay. If the pain is more concentrated in or around the joint, then it is not necessarily your rotator cuff problem, correct? Well, again, the typical rotator cuff pain is in the side of the arm, kind of dull and achy. Sometimes people have more anterior pain, and that can be something else like the biceps tendon. The biceps tendon lives directly between the subscapularis and the supraspinatus, right in this groove up the arm and it dives between these tendons and attaches to the top part of the socket. So pain in the very front part of the shoulder can be a biceps tendon problem. Arthritic pain can be in the front and the back side of the joint, but, but typically rotator cuff gives you an anterior lateral arm pain, side of the arm, between the shoulder and the elbow. Okay. Can a repair be done, well, two part, can a repair be done in an outpatient setting, and also can it be done without general anesthesia? Most rotator cuff repairs, I would say, are done outpatient these days. General anesthesia, that's going to be up to your surgeon and the anesthesiologist. Um, I've done shoulder replacements in patients who are awake. Um, so I, the answer is yes, it can be done. I think it's unlikely to keep you, it's unlikely to be done that way just because we don't want you moving around too much, especially if we're doing it arthroscopically and working through small spaces. Okay. Can a ball pop, pop out of the socket often? If so, how do you prevent this? That's a great question. Yes, the ball can pop out of the socket very often. Um, instability of the shoulder is one of the more common problems that we see in the shoulder joint. Some of that has to do with rotator cuff tears. Some of it has to do with labral tears, which is the cartilage that surrounds the socket. Sometimes people that have repetitive dislocation of the shoulder can lose bone, either at the back corner of the ball or the front corner of the socket. So there's lots of things to consider with dislocating shoulders, and the treatment for dislocating shoulders has to address all those issues, the labrum, the rotator cuff, and potentially any bone loss uh, on the socket or the ball. So there are things to do with it, uh, depending on what your x-rays, MRIs, CT scans show. Okay. Every time I, well, a couple of people have asked about popping noises. So every time I lift my arm, I hear a loud popping noise, some pain, and I also lost strength in that arm. What could it? I'm sorry, could this be a tear? Popping noise are very common. So I, I tell patients, first of all, if it pops and doesn't hurt, don't worry about it. I've got more clicks and pops in my body than I care to admit. And as long as they're not hurting me, I don't get too bent out of shape about them. Um, if it's a painful pop and you have weakness, that's more concerning for me. I worry about a torn tendon, a biceps tendon popping in and out of this groove, um, or, or something else like a loose body in the shoulder, a piece of cartilage that might be floating around causing that mechanical symptom, giving you pain, popping and clicking. Okay. Can a rotator cuff tear heal itself? Great question. Full thickness tears cannot heal themselves. Partial thickness tears can heal themselves. 
In general, when it comes to partial thickness tears, the rule of thumb is 50%. If 50% or less of the tendon is torn, we usually treat it non-operatively with injections and therapy. In those cases, they can go on to heal. If it's more than 50% torn, it's usually not going to heal by itself, and that's when we say surgery is indicated for those partial thickness tears that are more than 50%. Okay. What are your thoughts on PRP for the tears or stem cell treatments? Yeah, I like these treatments a lot. The problem is there's not a whole lot of great data for these two treatment modalities. So PRP solutions come in vastly different concentrations. So different manufacturers make their own PRP solutions. We take this uh, from your own blood, we spin it through a centrifuge. The centrifuge, uh, depending on who makes it, can spin it at a faster pace or a slower pace. The filters that we use to get rid of the red blood cells and the white blood cells can filter out more or less of those blood cells. So you wind up with hundreds of different concentrations of platelet-rich plasma. So we don't know the ideal concentration of platelet-rich plasma for any application in orthopedics. To me, it makes a lot of sense because platelets are fragments of cells that signal stem cells to come in and do their job. The problem with stem cells and platelet-rich plasma is this. We expect that by injecting those things into a worn out joint, a partially torn tendon, that because they're in the same neighborhood as the partial tear or the arthritic joint, we expect those stem cells to do their job and make that new tissue. But during your development from an embryo to a human, there's many biologic signals that are directing the stem cells. So we're injecting cells with no direction Whereas when you are growing and developing, these things are directed through a very specific pathway through a lot of biologic interactions. And we haven't cracked that code 100% yet. So I tell patients the same thing every time with stem cells. Stem cells are expensive. If you're Oprah Winfrey or LeBron James, you can have as many stem cells injections as you want. If you're uh, Dr. Walker or somebody else that maybe doesn't have as much money to spend, it might not be the best thing to do. Perfect. I've had a couple people ask about being in a sling too long. Is that possible to cause to cause frozen shoulder? It, it can cause frozen shoulder. The, the shoulder joint has more degrees of freedom than any other joint in the body. It likes to move. And when you have an injury and when you have a surgery and when you get stuck in a sling after those things, you can get stiff from being in a sling. So repairing rotator cuff tendons is a balance between getting too stiff and moving too frequently. I always tell my patients this. I want your tendon to be healed as my first priority. If you get stiff and we can't loosen up with therapy and injections, we can deal with that down the road. But the most important thing is get the tendon healed first, worry about the stiffness later if it happens. And I would tell you, maybe one out of 20 patients get stiff enough after a rotator cuff surgery that they need a second procedure just for the scar tissue. Okay. Is there, the, is there a most common cause for rotator cuff injuries? The most common cause is the wear and tear problem. And, and that's what nobody wants to hear, but the truth is as we age, our tendons thin out, and at some point we might develop a small tear, just like I mentioned earlier, I might get a small tear in the toe or the heel of my socks. Small tears in my socks don't bother me, I still keep those socks. <laughs> uh, bigger tears, I have to get rid of the sock and, and you know trade it for a new pair, uh, when my wife makes me do it or something. Um, but, but same thing with rotator cuffs. The tendon thins out over time. You might develop a small tear that doesn't have a lot of symptoms, but at some point that tear gets to a certain size that starts causing you problems. Okay. So wear and tear. Perfect. I know you mentioned just a minute ago about when you start physical therapy after surgery. Um, the question is how, how soon is too soon to start, frozen, start, start physical therapy after surgery? I think it depends on your therapist and your surgeon. In general, I like to hold off for six weeks as long as patients are doing the elbow bends and the arm circles by themselves. Sometimes I think the therapist gets too aggressive and moves you too much too fast, which can be detrimental. There's some data that shows that if you move too fast or go to therapy too soon, you have a higher re-tear rate, which means you're doing a little too much too fast. So if the therapist is very controlled about what they do and what they let you do, I think it's probably okay to start sooner. But if, you, if you're a patient that doesn't have a lot of soreness from the surgery, you're not too painful, some therapists want to push you more and more if it's not hurting you, and I don't think that's a good idea. I think you have to respect the biology. The biology takes three months for the healing to occur, and yet you go slow until three months. Okay, very good. 
A couple questions about people working from home now remotely. Will they be able to type on their laptop after rotator cuff surgery? Yes, um, I always tell patients uh, the easiest patients to deal with after rotator cuff surgery are the people that work at a desk. I let you type, I let you write, you might have to adjust the position of your keyboard, you might have to use an office chair that gives you some elbow support, you might have to push the keyboard back on the table so the arm can rest on the tabletop, but you can use desk work. The hard patients are the laborers, people that uh, work in heating and air and they have to lift heavy equipment and climb up ladders. Those patients might need four months out from work. For desk jobs, you might be able to go back a week and a half after surgery for a desk job. Okay, great. If my shoulder pain is more posterior, is it not likely to be a rotator cuff tear? It depends, it depends. Most, most rotator cuff tear pain, again, is the side of the arm, but you can have a posterior tear that gives you more posterior pain. So it's hard to say. When I hear posterior pain, I have to think of a couple things. How, how old is the patient? Younger patients, I worry a little bit about more posterior labral injuries or the cartilage. Older patients, I tend to worry more about arthritis, uh, which happens in males more on the back side of the shoulder than the front side, if that makes sense. Okay. Question about golf. I love playing golf. Is this something I should avoid if I'm already having pain in my shoulder? I think you, if you don't play golf, you're going to have uh, uh, other issues. You know, you need to go to golf for your mental health and, and your physical health. So I, I think if the shoulder's bugging you, get it looked at. Uh, but don't give up what you want to do uh, because of the pain. I, I always tell patients, I think my job as an orthopedic surgeon is getting you back to doing the things that you want to do and the things that you need to do. And uh, in golf, you can say, I need to do it and I want to do it, so I want to get you back to it. Um, so, so don't avoid it. Just get your shoulder checked out. I'm sure that will make a couple of people very happy. Um, a patient saying, I am having my second cortisone shot tomorrow in my shoulder at a pain center. I've seen a chiropractor for several months, but I've not had an MRI on my shoulder. Should I continue going in with doing the injections or pause on them and have an MRI? I would pause on them. I'll tell you why. I don't love cortisone as a treatment modality for tendon issues because what we learn every year, uh, there's a new study that shows how bad cortisone can be for tendons. Now, that's not saying I never give a cortisone shot and you should never get a cortisone shot, but we know that if you have a partial tear, it can make the partial tear progress when you get cortisone shots. Cortisone shots can also make full thickness tear progress to something bigger. So I'm a, I'm a cortisone, I, I, I ration how much cortisone shots I give to patients. I, I like one cortisone shot and then I use Toradol, which is anti-inflammatory, uh, more frequently these days. Okay. So, so I wouldn't do too many cortisone shots before you get it looked at by the doctor or the MRI. What about massages? Will that help my shoulder? I think it depends. It, it's not going to help a torn tendon heal, but a lot of times if you have a torn rotator cuff, the ball and socket joint might not move normally. So the other muscles that move the shoulder blade, like your trapezius, your rhomboids on the side of the shoulder blade, those muscles can be overworked and fatigued and massage will help with soreness around the shoulder. Is it feasible to eventually play tennis again after the surgery? I hope so. Again, my goal is to get you back to doing the things that you want to do and the things that you, you need to do. And again, tennis is like golf. You want to do it, but you also need to do it. So I, that's what I hope. Okay. Back to normal. Does rheumatoid arthritis and its inflammation have any effect on tendon susceptibility to tear? It does. And I would tell you that rheumatoid patients tend to have worse tendon quality than patients without rheumatoid. Rheumatoid arthritis causes an inflammation of the synovium or the lining of the shoulder joint. If we look at my diagram of the layers of the rotator cuff tendon, the synovial lining is right underneath the bottom part of this tendon, and the inflammation from rheumatoid arthritis can cause the tendon layers to become inflamed and irritated over time. So you can have poorer tendon quality in uncontrolled rheumatoid shoulders. Okay. Is there any preferable season to have your shoulder done? Spring, winter, summer? You know, I think it depends. I, I think the key thing is not to kick the can down the road too long and avoid other problems such as the tear getting larger or the muscles undergoing fatty changes. Uh, I don't think the season, I don't think you're going to recover easier in the summer versus the winter, but you might want to think about what do you like to do in the summer versus what do you like to do in the winter. I have a lot of patients that are hunters, they don't want to miss the hunting season, so they push everything back into the end of the hunting season. 
you know, in the summer, I like to surf and go to the beach, so I wouldn't want to have my shoulder worked on in the summertime. Uh, so I think it depends on what you do for fun, what you do for work, um, but I wouldn't say one season is an easier recovery than another. Okay, very good. The next question is, let me see, I want to make sure we did the same one. Um, I have trouble reaching overhead because of pain. Is that something that I should be seen for? I think it's if it's substantial and every time you reach for the you know, the top shelf of the kitchen cabinets, I think it's something to get looked at. Okay. Another question. I had unsuccessful rotator cuff surgery in 2011. I have fairly good functionality because of physical therapy, but are there any new procedures or techni techniques that might help repair it now? There are newer techniques that we can use uh, considering uh, back since back in 2011, I think you said. Um, a lot of this depends on how the tendon quality looks. So it would take a new set of x-rays, probably a new MRI to see what the tendon looks like. But we can augment some of these repairs with uh, biologic implants, uh, such as a tendon graft or patch, which helps in certain cases. Sometimes I augment these things with, with PRP or stem cells in the hopes that they will make uh, an improvement. Uh, and then we can also use uh, extracellular matrix uh, in some of these cases as well. So I, a lot of it depends on what the tendon looks like nowadays, um, but there are potentially solutions for a problem like that. Okay. I just turned 70 years old and have pain in my upper, I'm sorry, in my left upper arm and shoulder. I'm unable to sleep on that left side. Can't lift a gallon of milk unless it's close to my body. Had an, sorry, had an MRI and it showed arthritis and a tear and was given an injection which worked for about two weeks. I don't want to do another injection. What are your suggestions now? I think if the injection only works for two weeks, I tell patients that's not a successful injection. Uh, in my mind, I want the injection to last you several months. Um, it depends on how painful you are. You know, arthritic shoulder with a rotator cuff tear uh, is a tough thing to deal with. We tend to give patients shoulder replacements for that problem. It's a special shoulder replacement called a reverse shoulder replacement, but you have to be ready to have it done, meaning you've got to have pain frequently, daily. It's got to interfere with your sleeping, with your ability to do things uh, that you want to or need to, and it's got to be pain that's not getting better with the injections and the therapy. So, so really, what do you do with that problem depends on how much is bothering you. For patients like you, I tell you, uh, here's the options. Uh, we pick those uh, solutions together. Okay. Um, we talked about MRI. Is there any way to tell if you have a tear on an x-ray or does it have to be on an MRI? Most of the time it's on an MRI or an ultrasound. X-rays by themselves can't show small tears. They can sometimes give us some clues that there's some problems in the rotator cuff. For example, you might see bone spurs in the area of the shoulder where the rotator cuff attaches. You might see some cysts or small holes in the area of the rotator cuff where it attaches. Only with massive tears can you tell that the x-ray is showing a rotator cuff problem. So small tears, most of the time, you won't see any evidence on the x-ray. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on whether CBD oil helps or acupuncture? I think CBD oil seems to help everything. Uh, Every patient that I get that's on CBD oil seems to help everything. So I, I tell you, I never want to, I never want to poo-poo anything. Um, so I'll tell you, people get relief uh, from CBD oil for certain pains, and I think if that helps, that's fine. Acupuncture we use uh, in therapy, and we also use a, a Western version of acupuncture called dry needling, which can help with certain muscle knots, stiffness, and pain. Uh, so I think if, if you're getting relief from those two things, I think then more power to you. I think use them. Okay. I know you've talked about taking some medicine. Do you have any preference on which type of NSAID to use for night pain? I, I think some NSAIDs are patient dependent, but the nice news is there's dozens of different anti-inflammatories. I like an anti-inflammatory that you don't have to take as frequently. Ibuprofen is an eight hour medicine. To get full effect on ibuprofen, you have to take it every eight hours. That's kind of a pain in the butt for me. I like something I take twice a day. Um, Aleve is a twice-day pain medication. Diclofenac, which I use frequently, is a twice-day medication. Um, so something you take less frequently, in my opinion. Okay. Do you have any recommendations for strengthening the, the shoulder to, excuse me, do you have any uh, exercises that would help strengthen or relieve pain in the shoulder if you're not a surgical candidate? There are several exercises for rotator cuff strengthening. 
I have a link to those on my website, uh, through the Ortho Virginia website. Um, some of them are rubber band exercises where the rubber band's tied to the door and you do internal rotation for your, uh, for your subscapularis, external rotation for your infraspinatus and your teres minor, and then with your thumb down, about 45 degrees from your body, not directly in front, not directly at the side, 45 degrees. If you do weights in that plane, that helps with the supraspinatus tendon. So rotator cuff programs are available on the AAOS website and through the Ortho Virginia website as well. Okay, I think we have one last question. You say tingling of the nerves is not caused by problems with the rotator cuff. What would cause the numbness? Positioning my arms in different ways leads to my arm going numb rapidly. Sure. I will tell you that the two most common reasons to have numbness and tingling going down the arm are either carpal tunnel in the wrist, ulnar neuritis, which is the funny bone nerve of the elbow, or a cervical compression of one of the nerves. Those are probably the three most common ways to have numbness and tingling down the arm. There are other less frequent causes of numbness and tingling, things like thoracic outlet syndrome can cause vague numbness and tingling in the upper extremity, but those are exceedingly rare. So you start with the more common problems like the carpal tunnels, the pinched nerves, and the cervical spine, and you go from there. Okay, mm -hmm. one last question. I have two partial thickness tears and one full thickness tear. I am using heat a lot to get blood flow and hopefully heal the two partials, also minimal physical therapy. I'm scheduled for surgery in late January, but I have no pain and full range of motion. Do you advise keeping the surgery or canceling? That's a great question. So uh, rotator cuff, again, the natural history of rotator cuff tears is that you usually start with a small tear that may or may not cause symptoms. At some point that tear grows to a certain size and you might get symptomatic from that. The rotator cuff tears that we see in the office are the ones that are causing symptoms. If you leave these things alone and don't do anything except for therapy, injections, anti-inflammatories, a significant percentage of people will eventually not have any more shoulder pain. The problem is over time, the tear will get larger. So even if you're pain free at some point, I'd expect the tear size to increase and the symptoms to return. So, so I would go ahead and schedule the surgery, keep with it, knowing that if you fix it now, you're doing, you're avoiding maybe a potentially larger problem down the road. Okay, perfect. That was our last question that we have. Thank you for all those questions. Thank you. Thank you for joining into our Facebook Live. Hopefully we answered some of your questions and taught you something about rotator cuff uh, issues. Um, and it, again, any more questions, come to the website, orthovirginia.com. You can find doctors in your area who specialize in these kind of procedures.